Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to pick up where we left off in verse 10 in a Bible study that I've entitled, Suffering and Standing in Grace. And here we are, we've come to the last study in 1 Peter 5, in the first letter of Peter, and we're going to end on the note that he began. So I ask you to open a chapter 5, but go back to chapter 1, and let's just remember how everything started off in verse 2. He said, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Jump to verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Look at verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 2, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. It says, As newborn babes desiring the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And again, chapter 4, verse 10 Chapter 4, verse 10. In verse 9, it says, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, and as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We started out looking at the grace of God, and now we're ending. It's like the bookends of direction in great suffering. The bookends of direction in great suffering is the grace of God. I mean, it's how God chose you and me. How we entered into our relationship with Jesus was the grace of God. It's his choice based upon not what we had to offer, but what God had to offer us. And look, you might be walking with the Lord for a year now, for five years now, for 10 years now. You start in chapter one, work your way to chapter five. No matter how much progress you've made, you are in a greater need of the grace of God today than you were even when you began. Because now you start in grace, but then you begin to continue in your own strength. You start to lean on your own understanding. You begin to look back not on what God has done for you, but now you start to emphasize, well, look what I do for God. Look what I've done for God. And you leave the grace of God. So Peter begins the letter. He's an apostle of Jesus. He's a man that was used greatly of the Lord. He was enlisted by Jesus himself. And Peter is remembered for his faith for his faithfulness and not his failures. That encourages me. That when he's remembered, we we studied this when we were looking at all the men and women in the hall of faith, of all that they could have been remembered for, of all that could have been shared, what they were remembered for, it was called the hall of faith, not the hall of failure. And so God remembers our faithfulness that he himself gave to us. And I believe in all the Bible, Peter's life is recorded for us so that we might see a vivid, glorious example of a life that was changed by the Spirit of God in a wonderful way. You know, when I see the world today, I shake my head at times wondering how God is going to reach into the depths of this world. Because it just seems to be getting darker and darker. The, the thinking is shifting. There, there's a, I was sharing with a pastor friend even yesterday that there's a seismic shift happening in our culture right now that comes around every, I don't know, 50 or 60 years. And it's a huge seismic shift. So much so that you see there's this this burden upon those that are seeing the changes to want to stop the change. And they they are wanting to stop. And I do too. I want to stop the change, but perhaps not the way that you want to stop it. And I would want to encourage you that the way that I want to see God change is by saving men and women by rescuing them from sin. I mean, the world is going to be, the world is going to be the world. From the fall of man, man, both Adam and Eve, men and women have been in rebellion against God. That's how it all started. 
And now we're seeing it more and more. And I think of someone like Peter, who was just living his life, just giving himself to, to a fishing business with his dad, fishing business with his friends. And God rescued him, even rescuing him from himself in his own weaknesses, changed by the Spirit of God. He was changed from a fisherman to a fisher of men. And remember the last time we were in chapter five, we were studying two of the three final exhortations or strong words to the suffering saints that Peter gave them. Pick up in verse five, just by way of review, in chapter five now. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse nine, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And that's where we paused. We learned last time to humble yourself. Clothe yourself in humility. We learned last time to soberly resist the devil. We learned that there was always a battle for the believer. It never goes away. Any spiritual progress is made, met with great resistance. You want to grow and be used mighty of the Lord? Satan wants to destroy and devour you. He wants to distract you. He wants to take away your dreams and your ministry and your kids and your family. He wants your entire life. And so the answer we learned in verse nine was to resist him. That's the key to victory. Resist the devil steadfast in your faith. That means we learn to take a stand on the word of God. And friends, if we're gonna learn to take a stand upon the word of God, we need to use the word of God. We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to meditate upon it. It's a repetitive instruction that any pastor that's going through the Bible will do with you. It's read your Bible and pray every day. That is a key to your spiritual growth. It'll be very challenging for you to resist the devil steadfast in your faith when you're not regularly taking in the word of God, washing your mind with the water of the word, having your mind transformed by the word of God, I mean, it's easy to take in all of the other input, and we do, and all of the other input changes us, changes our thinking, changes our perspective, and we need to take a stand upon the word of God, refusing to be moved, refusing to be distracted. It means we'll also take a stand upon the power of God's spirit, receiving, surrendering, saying no to sin, yes to righteousness. And with that in mind, verse 10 now, Verse 10 is where we left off. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you suffered a while, perfect you, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. These are the final words of Peter to the scattered saints. He also spent some time in chapter five speaking to the elders and the spiritual leaders, those under great persecution with Nero. Here are his final words. His final words are committing you and me to the grace of God. May the God of all grace. God's work in us, especially when times are tough, are to do these four things. If you're taking notes, you wanna look for these four things. This is the work of God in your life to perfect you, to establish you, to strengthen you, and to settle you in the Lord. No trial is wasted, no difficulties not used by God in your life, but at least one of, if not four of these things are what God is working in your life. No matter how hard it gets, we learn to hang on to hope and to see these things. So number one, God, that, that, that commitment for Peter is, that God would perfect you. You can circle that word and right next to it, equip you. 
perfect, to bring a place of bringing together. Like, like the idea of this word in the original language is to adjust and to fit together. Like God is putting things together in your life because of trial. That's the exact opposite of what you feel. What you feel is like things are all out of control. Everything's chaotic. Everything's falling apart. That might be the work within the world. That might be work in your heart. But what God is doing is he's perfecting you and putting things together. Letting things be taken away and then adding things to strengthen you. It was used to describe in the first century a word to use to describe the mending of nets that have been stretched and used and broken. You can jot it down in Isaiah chapter 26, verse three. I love this. The Bible promised, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Number one, you suffer for a little while, God, that he might perfect you. Secondly, that he might establish you. This is a great word too. It means to fix or to set fast. You might use this word to describe the setting of concrete where, where God is trying to firm you up through the trial. In 1 Thessalonians chapter three, it says in verse 12, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God to set fast like concrete. Thirdly, notice he says to perfect, to establish, and thirdly, to strengthen you, to strengthen you. This word literally means to make strong, to build you up like muscles, like like a weightlifter, building up their muscles. The Lord wants to help you through it all, making you stronger, enabling you to face the demands of life. In Philippians chapter four, verse 13, It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We need his strength. We need his strength in times of great weakness, not our own strength as we pray today. And then finally, the work in these final days, the God of all grace is to settle you, to settle you. This speaks of giving you a firm foundation or to add to your life security. In Hebrews chapter one, verse 10, it says, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Or in Ephesians three sixteen, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. These are the four things that God is doing right now in your life. The world's falling apart, but God is strengthening you. In the New Living, it says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus, so that after you've suffered a little while, he will restore you, support you, and strengthen you, and he'll place you on a firm foundation. Now, that's not what it feels like. It feels the exact opposite. As things are coming into your life, things that are outside of your control, or as the believers are facing here with Peter's writing to, they're on the run, they're unsettled, they're fearful, they're concerned. They are looking at life in a very weak place. And Peter says, no, you have to understand God is at work. God is at work. Notice again in verse 10, God is described as the God of all grace. It reminds me back in 2 Corinthians chapter one that God is described as the God of all comfort. All comfort, all grace. Jump down to verse 12, he says, by, by Silvanus, our faithful brother as I consider him, I've written to you briefly exhorting you and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. The God of all grace the true grace of God in which you stand. Suffering and grace and standing, they all go together. Suffering, standing, and the grace of God. The very foundation of our lives is the love, mercy, and grace of God. Paul, when stirring up young Timothy, said this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. He said, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, Timothy had a lot of difficulties 
a lot of emotional concerns. He, he was more, a, more of a timid young man. He was put into great places of responsibility as a young man, inexperienced. And you know, when you're looking at to encourage someone, it, we don't normally and typically encourage someone, you know, I want you to be strong in grace. I, I just want you to rest and relax in the Lord. No, rather when we're encouraging and exhorting people, we might say, be strong in the word or be strong in obedience, or be strong in confidence. But Peter says it here, Paul says it, Jesus would instruct us, I want you to learn how to trust me. I want you to lean on the grace of God. I want you to be strong in grace, because God is the God of all grace. I think of the time that Joshua took over leadership over the nation from Moses, You remember in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse seven, it says, Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage. The Lord is the one that goes before you. You know, that's a common encouragement. It is encouragement. Be strong, God is with you. Fulfill what he's told you to do. David, when he was talking to Solomon on his deathbed, said this, be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Paul himself would use this phrase, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. But it's with Timothy and Peter, they say, you know what? You need to be strong in grace. What is grace? Well, grace is the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. Many times you might use the word grace to remember uh, a perspective of understanding grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. And it really cuts to the heart of who you and I are, thinking that we deserve something from God. And we come with this attitude of, I have, so therefore you do. But the Bible would teach us differently that God has done, and we have nothing to offer God. I mean, who are we to demand anything from God? I imagine you have come to a place, suffering will bring that to you, where you know, I remember even asking God, just wrestling in my own humanity, just like, you know, is this the reward that you give to a faithful saint? Is this what it is, Lord, this kind of pain? And I just remember going through a season, and, and it wasn't in that moment, but it was a little bit later on where God very graciously saying, so, so Ed, so, so th- you've been a faithful saint, huh? You've been a faithful saint. You're, you, you have, it, it was almost like Joe being under the broom tree, you know. Joe, don't you understand who you're talking to? Do you understand where you were? I mean, I- anytime I'm sharing my, my testimony, it reminds me of just how far I really was from God. I mean, even as I begin to share it, it's hard to, re- it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe just how far and how resistant and how anti-God I was in my life. And at the same time, I would probably say, well, I'm a pretty good guy. And I would find the worst person possible just so I could compare myself with the worst person. And I was one of those guys you would just look and go, man, there's no, what, what a wasted life. You might as well, let's move on to someone that's not so far gone. But that's not how God sees it. God reached out to me. He reached out to you by the grace of God. And it doesn't change. Our relationship continues in the grace of God. Our relationship will transition from this world to the next, how? By the grace of God. Wise is the servant of God that will realize that it's not, doesn't just start in grace. It doesn't just continue on in grace. It doesn't just end in grace. It is all grace. Because God is the God of all grace just as much as he's the God of all comfort. That tells me that the grace I experience, the grace I experience truly comes, like like if you're gracious toward me, that was God being gracious toward me. I receive it and I'm grateful for it, but he's the God of all grace. You could have never been gracious to me had God not been gracious to you. And we get to spread it around and share it. But I love that he ends with this sense of like, I know it's hard, Because when you're going through suffering, you know, when you're really wrestling with difficulties, you have a tendency to elevate yourself in a place and a position that you don't belong. You begin to speak with a different language about what you deserve and what you need. It's been said that man is broken, but he lives by mending, and the grace of God is the glue. 
that mending, that work. I mean, coming back and just saying, oh, Lord, you're so good that where I am right now, I'm suffering for a little while, but you're perfecting me, you're establishing me, you're strengthening me, and you're settling me. And really, Paul was just passing on what he already received. We know in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul was crying out for that thorn to be removed, the answer from God was, no, you're going to live with this, Paul. But when you live with this trial, when you suffer for a little while, Paul eventually would understand. He says he would say in another place to the Corinthians, for this light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working out for me a far greater glory in the present. Like it's just for a moment, just for a little while, which gives me hope. Because that also tells me that my, the trials that I'm in right now, they could end before I get into the presence of the Lord. It could truly just be a little while right now. And that's certainly my prayer as I'm waiting upon the Lord. It's like, yes, I'd love for this to end right now. But ultimately, it will end as I end up in the presence of the Lord. And the answer from Paul, or the answer to Paul from God was, hey, look, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I mean, you you think of how many times we pray for the strength of God. How often do you pray for personal weakness? Lord, make me weak so that I can experience your strength. (laughs) No way. But that's a great prayer to pray. You may find yourself today even wrestling with weakness, measuring up your life and finding areas in need of improvement. God would say to you, be strong in the grace. Be strong in my grace. Just expect the Lord to bless you, not not because of you, but in spite of you, the grace of God. Understanding it, receiving it. I love he doesn't end his letter by saying, okay, now to the God of all judgment. Oh, okay. Although God does bring judgment. He doesn't end the letter saying, oh, now to the God of all condemnation. Because when you're in a place of weakness and demanding what you deserve, man, condemnation's knocking at the door. Saying, who do you think you are? Not the gentle voice of a gracious God, but the wicked voice of an evil devil or even your own flesh, putting yourself down because of the weakness. So here you are learning to understand it, to receive it, to extend it, because grace is the foundation to a strong, healthy growing life in Jesus. So how does the letter begin? Grace to you. How does it end? To the grace of God. He is the God of all grace. And because of that, I want you to know that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. You can't stand in anything else. You can't, you know, so you are a man or a woman of the word. That's great. But you can't stand in that. Or you have been walking with the Lord for 30 years. That's wonderful, but you can't stand in that. Well, I have these accomplishments and I have these degrees and I've worked this hard and, and I've got these... Accom- okay, that's great, but you can't stand in that. You need to learn to stand in the grace of God. And Peter learned this. Peter learned this. He learned firsthand of God's gracious grace. Peter and Paul together are teaching us the same thing. No longer leaning on his flesh, no longer leaning on his own strength, He casts his whole life upon the Lord, depending upon the Spirit. Peter knew in his own life it wasn't partial grace. This is the man who in his deepest, in the deepest hour of Jesus, denied him. This is the man that said, I will never deny you, even if all of these deny you, I'll never deny you. Who stood so confidently and yet fell so hard. And so difficult, perhaps even to the point in this time in his life where he's like, I don't don't have any hope. Uh, I don't have any future. I think I'll just go back to where I started. It was a great ride, but I'll just go back to where I started. But Jesus met him and we learned that God is the God of the second chance. Peter's not writing like, oh, I have so much to offer you. I'm the guy that, I mean, how many times do you think Peter would think, as he was writing, but I'm the guy that denied him. Who am I to write this? I'm the guy that denied him. I'm the guy that ran out of him. I'm the guy that stood strong and he had these memories constantly plaguing him. Remembering, no, but I'm here by how? The grace of God. How else could I be here? I'm not remembered for my failure, although it did get recorded in the Bible. And it did get, it is there. But so is John 21. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. I'm going to restore you back into even a greater portion of ministry, 
a greater. So he knows it's not just partial. He knows it was all grace. And I think that's one way that we learn it over time. We start out really strong as new believers and then over time, trial after trial after trial after difficulty and not even necessarily big, huge ones, although there are some. And not, not necessarily overwhelming ones, although there are some. It's just the daily grind of battling the flesh, the daily grind of fighting temptation, the daily grind of looking at this world and where it's headed and what's happening and just being so burdened and brokenhearted. We learn day by day, suffering by suffering, warfare upon warfare, that we too must stand in the grace of God. Or another way of looking at it is we too must abide in Christ, receiving and relying upon his resources. I mean, I think of it, you guys that work at a company. When you work at a company, you rely upon their resources. You are fully trusting in what they provide to you. You are expecting them to give you the tools that you need to accomplish the work that they require. And you are in reliance upon, and sometimes that's lacking. Sometimes you you may work for a big corporation. I know how many times I had to say, oh, I'm sorry, there's not room in the budget for that. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not room in the budget for that. Just make do for that. Just make do. And you just, the folks that worked with me, they'd be so frustrated. They would even go out and go buy things so that they could have the tools. But in reality, they were depending upon the resources that, that unlike some company that's not giving you everything that you need, When you abide in Christ, you get everything you need to live a life that pleases Jesus. So you stand in his grace. You have to. Any other place will be a place of weakness. God God wants to bless your life and he wants to use you and he is ready to equip you for every good work. He is working in your life to equip you even though you are or you have messed up. And I love this. He's not the God of all wrath, not the God of all judgment. He's not the God of all works and self-effort. You know, you get to the place, you receive a letter, man, you're so going through it. You got these encouragements that we've studied now verse by verse, and then you get to the end, you go, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Here's what you need to do. You need to do nothing. You just need to stand still. Just stand still and wait for the Lord to work. Yeah, but I don't like standing still. That's, that's why things get harder and more challenging. Just stand in the grace of God. Meditate upon it. He's not the God of all works and self-effort. He's the God of all grace. Remember in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says Jesus came full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So the atmosphere for our spiritual growth is always the grace of God. You can't have too much grace flowing in a church, in a home, in a marriage, with your kids and your friendships. Listen, Bible teachers, parents, those that are influential and others, mentors, disciplers, teach the word of God with an emphasis upon the grace of God. Teach it in such a way where people fall in love with what God has done, not not what God has done for you, not what you must do for God. And be reminded of his goodness. The gospel is the good news of God's grace. But some say, wait a minute, Ed. If you teach grace that way and you emphasize grace, won't the people just run wild? Don't you have to give them rules and lists and tell them exactly what they're supposed to do and then make sure that when they don't do it, you get them back on track? No, that's not the grace of God. That's man-made religion along the way. You, might even, you don't even need a church to do that to you. You might be more comfortable with a list of rules and regulations. But you know what would happen if I gave you? Let's just say today, hey, we're changing the whole philosophy of our ministry. We are no longer a grace. We are a grace and list ministry. And we have lists printed out for you ready. We'll send it on on the app. And, but everybody here, we have a special for you. It's a free list of 10 things you need to do to be right with the Lord. Some of you will just wad it up before you leave, put it in the back of the chair and go on, honey, time to find another church. But you know, a lot of you will really pay attention because you trust me, you will really pay attention to that list and you will follow it to the best of your ability. And you will 
create in your mind. It's like, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. You might even rearrange it, take it home. Some of you will get out your Excel spreadsheets. You'll rearrange it. You'll put the easier ones on top and the harder ones on the bottom. And you'll just start working the list and working the list. Day one, you get, I don't know, let's say you get five. Your whole goal is just, I just want to do five. So you get the five easiest ones. Boom. Day one, you hit all five. Well, what about the other five? Don't worry about it. I'm going to use the list the way I want to use the list. And then you, then day six, you add one. Day seven, you add, you're, you're working the list until you fail on one of the points. And you know what happens when you fail? Well, a lot of things will happen. But one of the things will happen is you will feel like a failure. Not because the Lord told you were a failure. Not because the Holy Spirit's speaking to you a failure. You will feel like a failure because you didn't follow the list. Amen. And the man made the list anyway. It wasn't a list that came from the Lord. It wasn't the list that said, this is how I want you to live your life. Set the Bible aside and just live the list. No, that's not God's heart. God says, God says this, abide in me and I'll abide in you. And my word will abide in you. And, and you can live your life trusting that the Lord is speaking to you. I mean, unless it's outright sin, you can do what you believe the Lord wants you to do. Obviously, outright sin, God's not going to be telling you to do that. But he will be leading and guiding you just to things like, man, I, maybe I'll reach out to my neighbor. Maybe I'll start a Bible study in my home. Maybe I'll pray for my boss. Maybe, I, who knows what, but the Holy Spirit will be leading you and you can trust him. Amen. It's not a list that the atmosphere of your growth isn't developing more and more lists. It's the grace of God. Let, let me show you. You've got to see this before we head out. Turn over to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Uh, I'm not concerned with you deciding, well, it's the grace of God. I can just sin as much as I want. That is not the grace of God. That's you twisting the word of God. It, the grace of God doesn't say, go ahead and do whatever you want, including sin. That's actually the exact opposite of what a true understanding of the grace of God will show you. And, and this is something that's super important because there will be those that love to hang a trip of legalism over you, want to tell you what to do and how to do it. And yet here's what grace teaches. I love this. In verse 11, Titus chapter 2, this is so beautiful and so encouraging. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us so here's what grace, when you understand the grace of God, this is what it teaches you. You ready? That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then here's the substance of grace, right? Here's the substance. Who gave himself for us? Let me ask you, did you deserve for Jesus to give himself for you? He gave you himself for you for the exact opposite reason, because you needed him to. Not because you didn't need him to, but because you were hopelessly lost in your trespasses and sins. So here he is. This is the explanation of grace, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So the grace of God teaches us to make decisions that would put us on the pathway of trusting and obeying Jesus. But do you notice the grace of God reminds us that he's working in you, purifying you, changing you, leading you, that you might become his own special people, like that you would be reserved for him. We learn in our study in husbands that are, husbands are to wash their wives with the water of the word. Why? Because that we might, like Jesus is doing that with the church, so he might present to himself a purified bride. That's the grace of God. The grace of God works in us as we are living for the soon return of Jesus. It works in us the purity and the necessary changes that will please God. And I've noticed that when people really understand grace, they really begin to grow and flourish. It doesn't become a list problem or a works problem or beating themselves up all the time. And the answer to everything is do more, do more, do more. The answer is actually do nothing. Just do nothing and stand in the grace of God. Just stop. 
Just stop all the activity. Stop all the fevers. Yeah, but Ed, it's, you don't understand. It's just, I'm so, okay, let's just stop and get back to basics. Right, the moment when you were saved, the moment when you were born again, the moment when you realize God's great forgiveness for you, you had nothing. There was nothing. There was nothing you had to offer. You came up humble and broken before him. And God says, okay, remember from where you have fallen. Repent and repeat the first works. What were the first works? Surrender. Acceptance of a gift. Appreciation for the goodness of God. That everyone had written you off, including yourself, but not God. And we repeat those things and God begins to grow us in our understanding and nourishment from the Lord. Spiritual growth doesn't happen in the rocky soil of the law, but in the fertile, lush, nutritious soil of the spirit. So now come back, these final words. You would think he was ended in verse 11, right? In chapter five, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Okay, thanks, Peter. But he keeps going, verse 12. By Silvanus. Now next to Silvanus, you might want to write Silas. Many people believe this was Silas. This is the same brother that traveled with Paul when he had that disagreement with Barnabas and headed over to Asia Minor. He was a friend and co-laborer of Peter, actually wrote down this epistle for us, so we can thank him for that. He says, by Silvanus, our faithful brother as I consider him, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. You know, Silvanus encourages me because he represents that guy, that gal, that is content to serve in the background. Just to do what he's been asked to do, to, to serve the Lord with his gifts, you know, there are those that think that the most rewarding place in the church is to serve in a place of prominence where everybody knows you. But in reality, a great place to serve in the church is when you serve the Lord faithfully and nobody has a clue who you are. And you can just keep your eyes on the Lord and you can serve in the background and, and you can be like the Bible describes that under rower where, where you are there just faithfully unseen, unknown, just paddling. The ship is moving forward. The boat is moving forward. And there you are just rowing underground. Nobody knows who you are, but you're faithful. And Sylvanus, I don't even know that he expected. I wonder how hard it was for him to write down, by Sylvanus. I don't even want Peter. No, I don't want them to know what I'm doing. I'm just that faithful brother. It was enough for him just to be a pen in the hands of God. Notice, he says in verse 13 now, she who is in Babylon elect together with you, greets you, so does Mark, my son, greet one another with a kiss of love, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus, the second, amen. He, he mentions the church in Babylon, which was another name for Rome, just describing how debauched it was, how sin-filled it was compared to Babylon. And then he mentions Mark here, that's encouraging and intriguing because Mark as well was involved in that separation between Paul and Barnabas. So Mark and Silas are both connected to Paul. And we'll learn if you read ahead in 2 Peter, you'll learn that even Peter, having been rebuked by Paul earlier on in his walk, had also brought back in reconciliation with him. And that all these guys, you know, you, you get to the guy, you get guys together, you get church together, there's always tension, there's always disagreement. But you know, in the end, we're wise to humble ourselves and go, you know what, there's disagreement, but we're all serving the same Lord. You do what God's called you to do, I'll do what God's called me to do, and then we together, even if we go our separate ways, will be used by God to do great things. So all these guys, when we study through, if you're not even unfamiliar with what I'm sharing with the difficulty between Paul and Barnabas, is that they end up separating. And instead of one missionary journey, now God has separated them. Now they're gonna have two missionary journeys. We'll get to that when we study through the book of Acts. Just know this now, that even through great difficulty and division, God can still win. And here they are now, mentioning at the end, Silas is mentioned, Mark is mentioned, Division's always sad, separation's always difficult, but God will get the glory. And Peter at the end here, he gives us a precious letter that encourages us to hope in the Lord no matter how trying the times might be. And throughout the years, the church has experienced very 
difficult, fiery trials. And yet the church is still here. Satan hasn't had his way. The gates of hell have not prevailed against the church. So as you see a new wave of difficulty in our own country, you see new difficulties that come against us, it is a time to open up and be flexible before the Lord of how he might use us in fresh ways. What is it that he is trying to pull out of? What is he wanting us to show us? I know there's this this sense of, but pastor, pastor, we want some sense of normalcy. We want to get back to normal. Well, perhaps the Lord will allow you to get back to some sense of normal. But that's not what he's desiring from us. He's desiring us from to go to glory to glory and strength to strength. He wants us to do a new work. He wants us to be flexible. And even as Peter's going, look, whatever's happening to you guys, look, you can't go back. But you can't stand in the grace of God. We can't undo the trials. Matter of fact, remember, he's already writing to a group that are going through fiery trials. And what does he tell the group in the midst of a trial? Hey, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that's about to try you. You think it's bad now. There's a worse one coming. But don't think it's strange. It's not strange. It's not strange that the world hates the church. It's not strange that a culture would want to suppress the voice of Jesus. It's not strange that people will hate you because they hated Jesus first. It's not strange that they would want to take Bibles away and they would want to have us on the run and freaking out and losing our mission. Our mission, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And so what's happening? The lost are becoming more difficult. Sin is destroying. I mean, you're seeing it with your own eyes. But I wonder how many of you were right on the edge of destruction yourself. Were you so much more prettier? Like, were you so much more unoffensive? Were you so much more acceptable? No, you just look different. You were as just a rank rebellious sinner as some of the things we're seeing today. And yes, we're to be salt and light, absolutely standing for what is right in a culture that's wrong. But we want to be accused like the leaders in the book of Acts, like, oh man, those guys have come here. They turn, those people that have turned the world upside down, they come to our city too. But I find that the world has turned the church upside down, not only accommodating culturally, adopting even the narratives of the culture, but then not even caring anymore or caring about the wrong things. Look, Jesus hasn't changed his mission. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. And the last time I looked, there are a lot more sinners in the world than there are believers So we have our work cut out for us. The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. And may the Lord send us as laborers into the harvest. The church today, you know, I think we're facing a new trial in our country we've never faced before. But we must be prepared because whatever may come, Peter is still saying to each of us, be hopeful. The glory is soon to come. Jesus is on his way. Stay strong. God is at work. He's restoring and supporting and strengthening and perfecting you, laying a firm foundation for your life. Why? So you might be a platform to reach others with the same gospel that reached you. So Father, we are grateful for this encouragement, this reminder, the work of Peter that you would show from a man that failed greatly. You're like, I just pray for those that have written themselves off because of failure tonight. You don't write them off. I don't write them off. We don't write them off. That there is a restorative power by your grace to tap into. That they might rise again to feed, to tend, to care for your lambs. Lord, I pray against any wave of condemnation among us. Yeah, maybe even through a list. I bet, I bet you somebody listening to me right now already has a list they've been following that they need to destroy and trust you by the leading of your spirit. Maybe they're just a list person and it gives them comfort and you're wanting to reveal to them you're not only the God of all grace, but you're the God of all comfort and you can teach them how to depend upon you and follow your lead. I pray, God, for the young people among us as they launch off into their life and their career and their, the direction of their, that you would empower them to stand strong as the young men in Daniel's time, that they would stand strong no matter the odds, no matter the temptations, that they would learn, too, to say no to unrighteousness 
and yes to righteousness, that they would develop new, good, godly habits that will enable them to enjoy a relationship with you, God. I pray with all the Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and video games and Fortnite and the things that so easily capture our attention, that Father, you would be the one that captures our attention and that we have all these other things in their proper priority, in their proper place, that our ears would have, that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying, that we would seek you early in the morning, think of you late at night, that you would even grant us in our rest dreams and visions of your faithfulness and your goodness, that you would remind us that you've promised to never leave or forsake us. And in the difficulties that we're in right now, and there are many in our, in our midst, I pray that you would perfect, strengthen, establish, and settle the saints that are listening to me right now. That their eyes would be looking toward your soon return. That they would be listening to grace that teaches us that you're working in us. You're working in us both to will and to do for your good pleasure. And that we would submit to you, Lord, and surrender to you. And just let us leave here today so grateful that you saved us and rescued us. As bad as it is now, right now, as bad as it is, it would have been worse (laughs) had we not been saved. It would have been worse if we would even be here to experience it. So we gratefully acknowledge the grace that's been extended to us And we don't want to trample it underfoot. We pray that tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223 or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.